we're going to actually look in Mark chapter 15. So we're, we're going back to Mark, although we're skipping way ahead in the story. So super, super, super preview from way down the road. Uh, chapter 15, I'll read the story of Mark's uh, story of the crucifixion uh, and death of Jesus. I'm going to start in verse 21, and I'll be reading out of the NIV. We're going to read through verse 47, and I think we'll have it on the screen as well. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, and then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, He's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. And in Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. And so Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. And then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Let's pray together. God, I pray that uh, in these brief moments that my words would be your words, that they bring a fresh a word into our lives about uh, the meaning of your crucifixion and how it should change us, how it should transform us. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Well, most of you have been with us here a while. We we're jumping way ahead in the story of Mark for this one. But as we kind of kind of think about this text a little bit, I, I do want to ask a question. I don't know if you've ever felt this way before or had this happen to you or had a moment like this, but have you ever um, been in a crowd of people and still felt completely alone? Do you know what I'm talking about? It seems kind of strange, right? Like you, you just like you're in this huge, you're around people, so you're not alone, but yet you feel alone. And there's all sorts of, complexities and, and reasons for that, but I think that's exactly what Jesus was feeling in this moment. Now, if you, you've followed us for a little while, there's been a lot of people following Jesus. There's been a lot of disciples that have been running around with him. We talked about when he was in Galilee, fifteen to 20,000 people, like, falling around everywhere. They're kind of crowding on him. They're wanting to heal him. They're even trying to escape across lakes. They're still falling around. Tons and tons of people had come to know him in all sorts of amazing ways. And then we talked about last Sunday when he gets on that donkey to ride in Jerusalem, and they're all excited. They're ready to lay down their lives for him, right? They, they, they waved the palm fronds, which was the, the, the sign of military revolt. They're ready to go to Jerusalem and kick out the Romans. And all that week, all this week, Jesus has been doing the exact opposite of what they expected. As we said last week, he was disappointing them in a major way. 
and it's led up to this moment. I mean, you got tons of people who are laying their cloaks down, saying, I will do whatever I want for you, to now heaping insults and watching from a distance and joining in the injustice of the crucifixion of Jesus. What in the world can happen in that few of days? And Jesus, even though there's a crowd of people, and this crowd of people that followed him, even his closest disciples, in the text it's really interesting because Mark likes to use this, this idea of distance and nearness all the time. He talks about see and hear and come near, and he talks about immediately. You remember that? We talked about that a little bit. Now he says that his disciples, at one point in the text, is right before, they're watching Jesus from a distance when he got arrested, and then eventually they all leave him. Even the women in the story, which are doing better than disciples, are still at a distance from Jesus. There's Roman soldiers all surrounding him, and yet he's sitting on a cross, well, standing-ish, on a cross, completely alone with all of these people. And what's interesting is everyone thought the same thing, which is still true, that Jesus was supposed to be the deliverer of justice. That's exactly what he was coming for, which, ironically, is exactly what he did, just not in the way that they thought, to be the deliverer of justice. But in this case, he was supposed to deliver the Jewish people from their oppression from the Romans, from occupation. And in the end, what happens? Instead of Jesus killing the Romans, the Romans are killing Jesus, which, by the way, has been a repeat story for the last 200 years. There have been Jewish messiahs that have risen up in the last 200 years, and every single one of them has been executed by the Romans and their movement. And so now here's Jesus, the greatest hope they've had. They think, this guy is really it. He's going to kill the Romans. He's in Jerusalem. they got the palm fronds, the cloaks, everything is ready to go. He's riding in on a donkey. And now he is being executed by the government. And if you remember, they hung a sign up there that said the king of the Jews, right? I don't know if, if you think about this, about crucifixion, because not everyone gets crucified when they commit a crime in Rome. Crucifixion is only reserved for certain types of people. And one of the things that I've always believed about the two people that are beside Jesus, I was always told that they're thieves. And that's not true. Because thieves don't get crucified in Rome. That's not what happens to them. See, when Rome crucifies someone, crucifixion really isn't just about torture and death, although that's what happens. Crucifixion is actually a political statement. Who Rome crucifies are revolutionaries. That's who they crucify. They crucify people who are leading movements against the empire to make a statement of who's the boss to make a statement of who is, the pers- who is the empire that brings peace. If you can think of it, crucifixion really is an ancient billboard. That's what, a, that's what happens. Actually, when you would walk along well-traveled ro- roads in Rome, in the, in, in the empire, you would see crosses with people crucified on the way because it's a political statement. They want you to know who is in charge and who is bringing peace. In fact, if you could, if think about the, what a billboard might say today. Like if I was driving on the road and, a Ro- and Rome put up a billboard, what would they advertise? What would they advertise by crucifying someone? What would that actually look like if I just saw it in words? It'd be maybe, maybe something like, fighting against peace, justice will always win. That's, and, and that was actually to be taken as a positive. They were doing everyone a favor. Look, these people are against peace. These people are trying to make a worse world than what we have in front of us because we know the best way to live in the world. That's what crucifixion was. That is how Jesus was crucified. And the two people beside him, I love how the NIV translates this particular text because if you look in here, it doesn't say thieves. Do you see what it says in here? It says rebels, which is actually a more accurate translation. The two people beside him were not thieves. They were rebels. They were revolutionaries. And they were heaping insults on him. So it was a lot of other people. Jesus was being crucified because 
he was a revolutionary. He was upsetting the status quo of the Roman Empire. He was showing them up. And even though, even under their legal system, still wasn't necessarily technically convicted per se, like under Roman law, they let him do it anyway because the Jewish people wanted it so badly. To go from laying down their cloaks, doing whatever they want for him within five, four or five days, wanting him to be killed on a cross. And what's ironic about the statement of justice in this text is that all around Jesus, injustice was everywhere. And people were either ignoring it, they were watching it happen from a distance, or they were joining in it. That's what they were doing at that moment. And Jesus was all alone. And oddly enough, for justice to happen... For Jesus to truly be the king of the Jews and the king of all creation, he had to go the path of the cross, ironically enough. That was the way to go. And he had actually said that if you want to be part of the kingdom of God, if you want to be my disciple, we remember earlier in Mark, and we haven't got to that part in the series, but we've said it so many times, he says, if you want to be my disciple, you must take up your cross and follow me. So the way for Jesus to be king is truly was the path of the cross, although the people that crucified him or wanted him crucified, that's not what they thought was going to happen. And it, everyone thought this was going to be the end to the rebel, to the heretic, to the false prophet, as they would call him, to the liar. God had intended this to be a doorway to justice, to declaring judgment on the cosmic powers of sin and death and against anything and anyone that had submitted themselves to it. Mark is even very explicit, and I love that he describes it in detail, that Jesus' death was a judgment on the entire Jewish temple. So if you, 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 the curtain of the Holy of Holies, which behind the Holy of Holies is where God's presence was supposed to reside, and only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. That's the only person that could do that. Everyone else would die. In fact, they, could, they even tie a little rope to the high priest in case he did drop dead, if he was unfaithful or he, wasn't, he was unclean in some sort of way. And I pull him out because I can't go in there. That's the only person that's allowed in there. It's supposed to represent God's presence. We talked about the temple being heaven and earth together. And when Jesus dies, the curtain is ripped in two. What does that mean? It's God's judgment on the entire institution of the Jewish temple. See, God had set this up from the beginning, set up a tabernacle, you remember this? We, we talked about this. He set up a tabernacle, it turns into a temple. God's presence resides with his people. And by this point in time, and Jesus had many, many encounters with those who were in charge, the temple had been completely corrupt. In fact, the first thing that Jesus did in this week after Riding into the donkey of Jerusalem, I told you this last week, the first thing he did when he walked in, you remember what he did? He walks into the temple, he goes to the, where all the money changers are in the temple who are ripping people off and exploiting other people in the temple and starts just thrashing things around, letting all the animals out, cracking whips. That was to make sure people didn't get stampeded by all the animals he was letting out, right? And he's just like, you know, you're, my house, God's house is a house of prayer and you've turned it into a den of robbers, that's what the temple had become. And when Jesus dies, it's not just ushering in salvation for us and when resurrection comes on Sunday, it is a judgment against the institution that was supposed to be a blessing to the world. It's humbling to say that because there's still institutions around now, right? And sometimes institutions can go the wrong way. Sometimes even institutions who do things in the name of God, can completely be not of God. And in this moment, the institution that was supposed to be a blessing to the nations, even to the Gentiles, had been judged. It no longer existed. God said, look, I set this up so that you could be a blessing, and you totally missed it. And Jesus' death caused that judgment when they were thinking the exact opposite was happening. They were executing Jesus because he was the one 
that was causing the institution to go awry, causing people to lose faith in God. And what's really interesting to me is that so many times when we talk about injustice, we have our own ideas of what that might mean. And sometimes we don't realize that there are moments, there are many moments right now that are happening where we choose to ignore injustice. There's many moments where we stand at a distance to injustice and watch from afar so that we won't get involved. And sometimes there are moments where we join in the injustice and we don't even know we're doing it. The people that were joining in Jesus' crucifixion, do you think they really thought that they were joining in an injustice? No, they thought the opposite. Justice is happening. They're finally executing the false prophet. They turned on him and within a week. No one who, who, who participates in injustice actually believes they're participating in injustice. No one ever does. And yet, what is God's response to all of that? It's the way of the cross. That's, just, that's what blows my mind about all of this. I mean, yes, Jesus was executed by a government for being a revolutionary. Yes, his own people gave him over. Yes, his closest followers followed from a distance and then even denied that they knew him. Even the women who were, who were elevated in the story of this particular gospel were watching even from a distance. The two rebels beside him, who were violent revolutionaries, hurled insults at him. Jesus was completely alone, and yet, in all of that, humanity, all of creation dished out its very worst, the cosmic powers of sin and death, thinking that they had won, and ironically, this was the path that God is using for our redemption, even when we are part of the injustice. And that's what's interesting to me about Jesus' response to the injustice that he sees around him. It's not a violent response like the two revolutionaries did on the sides. That's what they did. They got caught. It wasn't that. He didn't do anything wrong. Even the Romans believed that. They still crucified him anyway because they didn't want him to disrupt too much of the empire, right? It wasn't vying for power. It wasn't trying to finagle his way into the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, or any type of sect of Judaism, the Zealots, the Essenes, the Sadducees, none of that. He even picked, a bu- he even picked his own disciples, which that was backwards. And he picked a bunch of rejects. I mean, this guy was doing everything the wrong way. All of the people who felt marginalized, Jesus gave them dignity and restoration and healing when no one else would. See, the funny thing is, God's justice was happening right in front of them, and they missed it. And in turn, if you're not for God's justice, then you're against it. Of course, they didn't know they were joining in the injustice. Now, three days later, when we talk about that part of the story, we're going to do a little 180 on the rest of the people. And what do you do with that? But Jesus didn't violently respond. He didn't vie for power. He didn't try to control entire groups of people like institutions would do. He wasn't telling others who was more worthy and more acceptable to God. He was identifying with them, coming alongside them, offering them a path, the hope, and life when no one else would. And many times, friends, may I suggest that when Jesus does that, It threatens your very way of life. Because there are so many injustices that surround us now. Some of them we have ignored. Some of them we have watched from a distance. Some of them we have participated in. But the promise I want to tell you tonight, no matter what our participation is, Jesus died for all of them. That's his response. His response is not just to watch you suffer, although the path of the cross is suffering, but the suffering has a purpose. The purpose is redemption and reconciliation 
and restoration, even with people who participate totally against what God wants. Because see, it's interesting, we'd like, I mean, I've said this before, Jesus didn't just die for our personal sins. He died for all of it. The cosmic powers of sin and death is more than just us. It is the institutions and systems of injustice that we create, that we participate in, that we watch from a distance, that Jesus died for as well. And when he took up his cross, might I say, from God, it was a political statement. It was a statement of how things should be. It was upside down. It was completely backwards. How in the world does this path of the cross actually lead to redemption and reconciliation and restoration? It doesn't make any sense. And at this time, at this night, no one understands. His response to the injustice, as we kind of talk about Wednesday, is to be the Passover lamb for all creation. So tonight, on Good Friday, and we can only call it good because of Sunday, by the way, Right now, in this moment, before Sunday comes, it's not very good. Jesus being executed by a government who thinks he's a revolutionary and his own people joining in on that is not a very happy moment. And so tonight you have an index card that has a purpose because tonight I want you to reflect on the injustices not only that you may have ignored, but maybe that you follow from a distance. Or maybe that you join in. And maybe you don't even think, like, I don't even know if I'm participating in those types of things. And I don't want you to to force this. I want to let the Holy Spirit reveal what those things are for you. What are ways that we participate in injustice? And what I want you to do, I want you to write that down on your index card. And I'm going to give you some time to do that as we pray together, but we're going to have our band come up. We're going to, we are going to have a song as you're reflecting. And after that reflection time, once we're done with that, I'll invite us again. Whatever it is you've written in that card, if tonight, if this is if you want to, if you desire to, if you want God to help you, to come alongside you, and helping you live a reconciled life in the midst of the injustices that we ignore or participate in, then in this bucket, there's a bunch of nails. Just be careful. It is sharp on one end. There are nails. All right, there's hammers there. You can take the card with whatever you've written and take a nail, and you can just nail it to the cross. Because no matter what you've participated in, what God reveals to you, Jesus died for that. He's offered forgiveness for that, and he's ushered in a new way of life for that if you will take up your cross and follow him. And the only way we can do that is to go the way of the cross and to crucify it. So let's pray together, and then I'll invite the band up uh, to reflect in song, and we'll continue uh, in prayer together. Let's pray. God, we know that confessing our sins is not simply just uh, reciting our faults and our wrongs or the injustices. We also know, God, it's an opportunity to receive your mercy and to share in your grace. And so, God, we ask for your help. We ask for your power, your spirit, so that we can change our lives to grow more each day into the image of Christ. And God, we just want to confess that What we fear um, most of the time is just what's different. It's a lot easier, God, for us to just lock the doors and watch from a distance than even to receive those who don't look like us or love like us or vote the way that we vote. God, we confess that we've not lived out your call to share in the abundant life and unconditional love, but God, we believe that you have the power to turn us around to a more grace-filled way of living. So we ask you to do that in these moments.
as we write down these injustices that we participate in, God, we ask that you would give us the courage to change. God, we ask that you would give us the energy and the intelligence and the imagination and the love to be your people in all the ways that we say and do. And everybody said,